Uh, historically, the uh, family of catalysts you hear about today go back to the 1980s with a work by Union Carbide. And there uh, we're talking about molybdenum vanadium oxide catalyst. And this worked very well, but um, the selectivity wasn't quite high enough, and the actual catalyst was uh, fairly amorphous. Then in the 1990s, Mitsubishi introduced a new catalyst family, uh, the so-called M1, M2 uh, mixed metal oxide structures. And this had improved selectivity. Later on in uh, the 2000s, Dr. Buttrey of University of Delaware and co-workers elucidated the um, structure of the M1 catalyst. And uh, a lot of advancements were being made, but we felt that still we weren't at the economic threshold. So this category of molybdenum vanadium niobium based catalysts has had quite a bit of success in commercialization. Uh, with the incorporation of palladium by Sobic, they've converted ethane to acetic acid commercially, incorporating tin. Asahi has a propane to equivalent nitrile commercialization. Antimony addition has led to development stages of propane to equivalent nitrile. And tellurium for propane to acrylic acid. Many companies have investigated that. The uh, talk you hear about today, some of the patents shown here, the uh, data and the uh, patent examples are uh, illustrated. And in our catalyst synthesis, we looked at different prep methods. We had a slurry method, a hydrothermal synthesis, microwave assisted. We looked at different families of catalysts, uh, multiple components with promoters, and conducted characterization work. The uh, slurry method, looks rather involved. It has to be very carefully monitored in terms of pH, temperature. In the slurry phase, a poly polyoxymetalates form under a dry drying procedure and calcination. You can conduct these uh, processes to favor the M1 structure. And then with post-treatment, one can remove the non-selective phases with oxalic acid, extraction, and then we have a special grinding stage where we preferentially expose the active phases. The, uh, quick one, another methodology for getting the hydrothermal uh, synthesis approach, uh, you can prepare the M1 structure this way. And it's uh, slightly different reagents and uh, temperatures are higher. If you incorporate, replace the uh, hydrothermal step uh, par bomb with the uh, microwave, you can reduce the synthesis time down to hours versus days and uh, achieve the catalyst synthesis. The uh, structures that are shown here, um, the preferential phase B is what we were after, the structure in the middle. And here, um, the preferred structure has a five, six, and seven member ring arrangement. The uh, top structure A, uh, we call phase A, which is uh, in the open literature called M2, is um, six member ring ordering and uh, less preferred. So as you can see, the uh, catalyst is needle-like. It can grow up to 200 nanometers in length. The uh, cross-sectional area, the 001 plane, is on the order of 20 nanometers. And through our post-treatments, we could uh, preferentially break along the uh, AB plane to expose more of the selective sites. And in the TEM, this is what the structure will look like, and you can see the multiple uh, oxidation states of the molybdenum, vanadium, and, and so forth. And this is the uh, work that Doug Buttrey and co-workers have elucidated. We ran conventional uh, fixed bed reactor systems to do catalyst evaluations. And um, the gas hourly was 1,200. We could run higher. The data you'll see today is 1,200. And first, we looked at the different prep methods that were outlined and found that uh, and in terms of a conversion selectivity curve, they performed in a similar fashion. 
the uh, microwave catalyst was slightly less active, required uh, slightly higher temperatures. And um, it, this is the uh, performance curve when we looked at different compositions. The um, inclusion of antimony was most preferred, giving us uh, selectivities appro approaching 97%. And then we underwent a different um, optimization of the composition with the tellurium, varying it the stoichiometry, and saw that the uh, various amounts of M1, M2 in the unknown phase were dependent on the tellurium. The uh, conversion selectivity curve, the optimal tellurium level was coming in at 0.125, and it was also the most uh, active composition. In a uh, similar fashion, we optimize the niobium content, varying it from 0.17 to 0.21. Uh, it was found that too high a level of niobium led to the amorphous phase. And the conversion selectivity curve, we were focusing in on optimal composition of 0.19. And again, this was the most active. So how does this compare to the uh, commercial cracking of ethane to ethylene, which is um, non-catalytic endothermic? At 70% conversion, we found with this uh, five-component catalyst system of niobium, uh, roughly about 15% higher in selectivity. Then further um, investigations were done. I don't really have enough time to uh, show everything, but we varied the, we were able to increase the ethane feed content for higher productivity up to 35%. Uh, we were able to dilute the um, use of diluent of steam versus nitrogen, which would be better for plant operating operations and also heat removal, and raise the pressure up to 30 psig. And under these conditions, um, there was good catalyst life on the order of months. So really the next step would be to look at it more from a uh, process scale up viewpoint. And surprisingly, the catalyst, um, our, our concern was if, if you ever had a system upset, it might undergo phase changes. But we were able to oxygen starve it for roughly two hours by raising the operating temperature, up to 390 degrees C, come back, regenerate the catalyst with air, and go back to the operating conditions again and not suffer too much of a loss in selectivity on the order of two to three points. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we felt it would be best to have a PPM level of uh, oxygen in the effluent to maintain catalyst stability and patented uh, finishing catalysts, as we called them, to remove the uh, res residual oxygen in the effluent. The uh, other concern was that there could be up to possibly 100 ppm acetylene in the uh, product slate. So um, to make this a safer uh, environment for downstream processing, we incorporated very low levels of platinum to finish off the um, acetylene converted to CO2. And we also looked at the tolerance of the ethane feed containing propane um, and saw no negative effect of running a feed of 6% propane and ethane in terms of selectivity. So uh, this short program and research, we felt we had achieved a composition and performance level that was adequate to be competitive with the ethylene cracking, the ethane cracking, and try to address what we thought were key challenges and provide solutions. But as you can see, this type of approach can be fairly uh, time-consuming. And um, you know, how can we be more logical about how we do our problem solving? And so, as you can see, going from the bench all the way up to manufacturing, this is the illustration of um, like and hydride process, but it's multi-scale, um, usually very complex, 
very dynamic, a lot of interactions. The catalyst is almost a, a living entity. It's very responsive to its working environment. And um, for problem solving, really you're looking at usually a bulk crystalline structure. It's uh, polycrystalline. The surface will be very different from the bulk. Usually you're talking about defects, morphous phases, different reaction conditions. It's usually a very complex uh, reaction system, as we just spoke about, with a multi-component mixed metal oxide. And traditionally, people solve the problem looking at it maybe in three different ways. Um, you know, you worry about making the catalyst, and then you have to be concerned about characterizing it and then relating it to the uh, reaction kinetics.